Okay, rolling. Excellent stuff. Well, welcome, Dawn Ford and Neil Murdoch. Thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, how are you both? Good. Really good. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very happy. I'm half Scottish, so I'm very happy right now. So, yeah. I'm really happy. <laughs> Penalty <laughs> shootout. Excellent yeah. stuff. What, what, how was the whole experience without really any kind of crowd scenario? Uh, horrific, because um, it was classic Scotland again. We were 1-0 up, we're, uh, 90 minutes had gone, and they equalised in the 90th minute, and then we went to penalties, and we scored all our penalties, and then he saved, the David Marshall saved the, their one. So it was horrific, mate. I was on the phone to my dad as well, and obviously he's Glaswegian. Um, so he was giving me some choice words when they were scoring. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, it was great. It was fantastic. It was great. Yeah, yeah it was good. Excellent stuff. Okay, so we've got some really interesting topics to discuss today around outcome-based work delivery in the context of some interesting market factors that everyone's dealing with at the moment, or we're all coming uh, up to having to deal with, ranging from COVID, R35, Brexit, and I'm sure we'll probably think of a few others. Um, but before we get into those topics, um, it'd be great if you guys could just give a little bit of a background on who you are, what you do, and I think probably most importantly, kind of how you got there. Um, would that be okay with you guys? Sure. Yeah, yeah, no worries, yeah. Excellent stuff. Right, who's going to go first? Oh, the, the Dawn. The, see that little nod from Dawn was, Neil, you go first. She's so giving you the nod. Learned over many years of presenting that to, that to you. When you see me look like this, <laughs> Dawn. Um, yeah, so I'm Neil Murdoch. So I'm Head of Solutions Development for Vault Consulting Group. Uh, been with the organisation coming up to five years now, but uh, actually I was here about 10 years ago. I didn't go to university because I'd just totally fallen out of love with education. So I went straight into, I need a job. After college, I went into recruitment. I was uh, literally just bashing phones. I was looking, I can still remember it. I was looking for Java developers on 70 pound an hour uh, and Vax VMS people. And I had to go through a list of a thousand and get that down to like 10 for a recruiter and did that. And then from there, jumped over the fence to uh, MSP side, then jumped over to having a I know marketing agency. 2008 happened, so that went spectacularly wrong. So then I went back over to MSP side, and yeah, just um, kind of always been in love with the consultancy side of MSP, RPO, all things consultancy, and kind of stayed in that. Really, is that what you're looking for, Johnny? Or I just no, it's really you? interesting. I think <laughs> no, that's really interesting. I think um. You know, you say about um, kind of just going straight from um, kind of school and college into, into getting a job. Yeah. It must be so weird for people at the moment in a university scenario. I, I've always kind of, you know, there's always that weighing that up. Um, I went to university and I kind of, I did a degree in environmental biology. Never used it. It was a great <laughs> learning experience and I had a great time, but I didn't specifically use what I studied. Um, and, you know, you learn so much in the workplace, just actually getting on with it. I've always kind of, it's always interested me that kind of the trade-off between one one route versus the other. But if you look at people in the situation they're in today, it's even before COVID with the with the amount of debt that people are coming out of the university with. It's quite an yeah. interesting one, really, isn't it? Yeah. It's what, terrifying. Yeah. The the weird thing is with with me and my friends, I'm about but depending on how long they went to university, I'm five to ten years ahead of them in my career because their uni years, I literally just was on like five pound an hour as a temp just like kind of grafting an agency and just literally got to start at the bottom and just kind of work my way through through the levels which was fine for me and obviously they've got very successful careers themselves but it's interesting the things they talk to me about I'm like oh yeah yeah I went through that yeah I remember that step up to that management level or to that bit or when you had to add a, a remote team to manage and they're like oh how did you do it and I said well you just have to kind of go along with it and learn it as you go a bit like you did at university and like oh right so that that kind of helps me I do miss the fact I didn't go to university and have those kind of exciting days and weekends with my mates. So yeah, that was kind of what I missed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for the people that are uh, at uni now, it's just just must be incredibly weird. But talking about uh, university, Dawn, moving on to you, you you studied something that I I noticed on your LinkedIn profile looks really interesting. What was it? You did an MSc in um, human oh, evolution I and behaviour. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm, I'm like the counter opposite to Neil. I was the eternal <laughs> student. They had to throw me out of university. You know, I barely <laughs> um, So I started doing a bachelor's degree in human genetics, which has been quite topical this week because... Yeah, I bet. Um, R&A 
yeah, vaccine which Pfizer's developing is uh, something which was literally science fiction 20 years ago. So uh, as a one-time geneticist, I find that enormously exciting. And you're know, quite right, I went from that to a master's in human evolution and behaviour, which was amazingly interesting. Uh, some of the most interesting people I've ever met, I met on that course. It was just 10 of us. Uh, it was a very close-knit course. We did a lot of study work together. Um, and then I went from that, and the reason I went from that is I love those things, but I didn't ever see that I was ever going to afford a house uh, in doing those things. And I did one day not want to live with my parents, much as I love them. Uh, so I cross-qualified into law. Uh, so I did a cross-qualification called the Common Professional Exam, or at least that's what it was called at the time, um, to get effectively the background knowledge of law that you need uh, in order to qualify as a solicitor. And then I did the legal practice course, which is the uh, final stage in the academic process of becoming a solicitor. So yeah, the eternal student. Um, and then from there, so through university, um, I had probably the weirdest and wackiest selection of jobs you could imagine. Uh, so I spent uh, seven years working uh, at Ann Summers in a variety of roles from customer services to complaints. And believe me, we saw some things. I'm, I'm learning so much, Dawn. I, honestly, <laughs> I didn't know half of this stuff. This is amazing. I want to do this every week with you now. <laughs> could, 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 uh, and did, did you manage to apply any of the uh, concepts of human evolution to working at Ann Summers? Were there certain things that... <laughs> I, don't, I don't think... Drop a chord there? I don't think the evolution's travelled that far there. Um, <laughs> I think actually mostly what it taught me is how to deal with an immensely angry customer, uh, which is then uh, something I used again. I worked as a bouncer at the University College Union uh, while I was at university, which was enormous fun as well. How do you get a very drunk uh, hockey team off the premises uh, when they're just passing out on the floor, when there's only one of you? Uh, I never really thought those would be skills I use again. I should say I probably don't evict people from Vault too often because they're passed out on the floor. But just that kind of conflict management, um, how to deal with people in difficult situations, how to talk someone down in negotiation, how to find a middle ground. Those are actually things which have all been incredibly useful in what I do as a day job now, which is obviously being uh, a lawyer in the uh, employment recruitment outsourcing space. Uh, and so in terms of my own kind of progression in that, I started as the most junior member of the legal team. That's where everyone starts as a lawyer, um, qualified in-house rather than with the firm, uh, which much suited me because I'm naturally very commercially focused. And uh, that kind of minutiae of detail, which law firms are fantastic at, just isn't what floats my boat. And in terms of coming to where I am now, which is uh, legal counsel for Vault across all of Europe, Asia and EMEA, uh, really saying yes just not knowing the answer. And actually as a lawyer, you very, very often don't know the answer, but just having the confidence to say, I don't know, I'll find out, we'll see what's possible. Um, and endlessly kind of challenging yourself to the next level is, is kind of where I've got to where I am today. Really, really interesting. And um, yeah, when, when I was you know, looking back at what you were doing around um, human evolution and behavior, I was thinking there's gotta be applications of that to the legal profession. Um, but then when you talk about being a bouncer and having to evict a drunk hockey team, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Very yeah. interesting, <laughs> interesting spin on it, but, yeah, but as you say, it's, that coming. <laughs> it's, it's thinking on your feet and problem solving and being adaptable and and dealing with people ultimately, isn't it? Yeah, um, being able to con confront your fears as well. That when you find yourself in a situation where you you haven't got any of the answers and someone is really wanting you to have an answer is is knowing enough to guide them through to what is probably going to be the correct next step and then hurrying back to your computer or your reference books and checking that what your instinct tells you is the right thing to do actually is the right thing to do legally so that must have stood you in very good stead for dealing with some of the extremely complex issues that are um that, that everyone's dealing with at the moment particularly yeah. brexit and ir35 both of which you know, ultimately, as a, a lay person, um, when it comes to the technicalities, I see both of them as relatively complex. Would you yeah. would you agree with that? Or do you think they're from a legal point of view, are they fairly straightforward? Uh, I think they're pretty much the opposite ends of the spectrum, actually. I think Brexit is so much more complicated than people think it is. You know, you've got 50 years of intertwined legal history. Um, you've got most of the EU um, operates off effectively the opposite premise in the law as compared with English law. So English law says, unless the law says you can't do it, you can. 
whereas most of the mainland European law says, unless the law says you can do it, you can't. Mm. Um, so that means that the laws are just structured in a completely different way from the outset, which is actually probably one of the reasons why there was sort of, you know, a lot of heads bashing between the UK and the EU through those 48 years when we were a member, um, simply because we think about things in different ways. Um, yeah. So that is fiendishly complicated and, and whatever the outcome at the end of this year whether that's deal or no deal the legal ramifications for that are going to flow on for 10 or 15 years afterwards it's it's enormous by contrast and i don't underestimate the complexity of ir35 um and I, I obviously say this as someone who's lived with it for 15 years so it seems straightforward to me because i've been living and breathing it for 15 years and if you come to it fresh it is a complex subject especially because there is a huge amount of case law in the past you know you can go and read up what it says in the statute pretty quickly you won't necessarily understand it but you can read it pretty quickly but 15 years of back history of case law is what you really need to understand the subject and that's quite hard to learn from a standing start but i think Speaking as a lawyer, the concept of IR35 is a whole lot more straightforward than what's involved with Brexit. But I think if both are novel concepts to you, they are both very complex when you come to them for the first time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Neil, from your point of view, if you look at factors like IR35 and Brexit, I, I don't know whether to include COVID in this or not, but you tell me what you think. But how, how, much, how much are these factors influencing solution design? in the work that you're doing for clients? Well, huge. Well, IR35, definitely. Uh, I think if I start there, because it's, it's probably the, the easiest one, um, well, easiest one out of the three. I'm not going to claim COVID or Brexit are easy. Um, but when clients come to it, they, they know they have to do something, but they don't know what. So that makes the solutioning quite easy because you have to walk them through that process. And normally that starts with Dawn educating them on what it is, what they can and can't do, and things like that so you kind of have to take them on that journey and it, it's much easier that way because then they're not they don't have predetermined ideas or what it is and then you don't get into the dawn please please kick in if you think i'm wrong in this but what happens is they say talk about ir35 rather than getting into solutioning and trying to solve their challenges what you get into is exactly what dawn says well what can i do what can't mm. I do? How can I get around this? What, what I've heard about statement of work. Is that the new lovely silver bullet that we're going to get? And can't I just set up a sister company over here? So they're, they're solutioning the wrong way. So they're solutioning to get around it rather than no, this is the challenge. This is what you've got. This is how you should tackle this and do it the right way. Oh, well, I've heard about this new insurance that I can get, which is going to cover us for everything. So you spend more of your time just navigating them away from the, the potholes or the holes they're going to fall into, then that goes into and they start seeing the solution you're bringing to them. So which is do it the right way. It's longer, it's more complex, but it is the right way to do it. Dawn, is that kind of, would you say a fair assumption to that, that first initial meeting on R35? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the recruitment, staffing and outsourcing industries have gone through so many changes in the law in the last 15 years. I mean, I can probably think of 30 or 40, even without giving it much thought. Um, and so it's really easy to come to that as a client, just as you say, Neil, how can I get around this? I'm seeing this as a problem, as opposed to how can I embrace this and see the opportunity that actually, if I redesign my processes now, and future-proof them, I can outcompete all the competition. And, and that is sometimes quite a difficult journey to take a client on because actually they want an answer tomorrow. They don't necessarily want to invest the time to get something in place, which will sort them out for the next three to five years. Um, and that is obviously part of the consultancy journey we go on with them. Yeah, and it's, I think it's really interesting in terms of people's approach and just their general attitude because you know, it ties into what you said earlier, Dawn, about you know, from a legal point of view, you're not just concerned with the, the minutiae, you're concerned with it from a commercial point of view. Yeah. And I think, you know, tying to what you were saying, Neil, about companies maybe sometimes starting off with this preconceived ideas, the wrong approach, how do I get around something? Yeah. It's, it's really just for businesses to look at commercially, what's the most effective way for them to get work done in the scenario that we exist in? Um, and how can they effectively operate as a business bearing in mind these um, factors that are being thrown into the mix. So it's, it's kind of that bigger viewpoint, isn't it? I definitely think that, you know, there are a decent amount of companies who are smart enough to take that viewpoint. But when you've got a time-bound factor, like IR35 kicking in next April, 
then that is something that does drive people to look in the short term quite often. How, how do you kind of, um, how do you shift people's mentality? Is it, is, it, is it, as you say, that education process that kind of kicks that in or, or is it a question of getting the right stakeholders? How do you approach that? Um, it's a bit of both, to be honest with you. I mean, I mean Dawn and I have kind of got it down to a T where I, I love the fact when you bring the solution guy, they're going to be like, wow, he's going to be selling. He's going to try and get something. When you bring the lawyer that has no ax to grind whatsoever and is just going to tell you right and you know what's right and what's wrong or how, how they perceive it, it does carry a much stronger message. Um, so we, we do... We do speak to them from from that level. So well, don't listen to the to the solution, the sales guy who you think is going to sell you something is your pre idea. Listen to the lawyer who's got no axe to grind whatsoever. And we're we're bringing this person in because they're the expert. They're the person that knows w- about this. And then what happens is on R thirty five, ultimately it goes to Brexit as well. And they go, well, what about this? What? And it, normally, again, don't correct me if I'm wrong, but there's so many sound bites out there in the clients that they just use or they've heard and you have to well no that's not quite right this is what it means and this is what was said because they've listened to the news because of what they read because of you know their family members this is it's much bigger than a a piece of legislation or something just coming in everybody has an opinion on it i've never known social media be so awash with experts when something gets released (laughs) you know so you have to kind of fight through that really don't you Dawn to to get to the point and take them on that journey really because yeah you never absolutely. Walk into. absolutely it always starts with education but from there it's really understanding who your client is uh, and as you say Johnny it's really about the stakeholders so understanding whether they're a client who is absolutely laser focused only on the money or uh, do the compliance teams actually get a say so in this because part of designing that solution every company has a different risk profile and that that's perfectly acceptable it's just you need to understand what that is before you can design the solution that is right for them because if you've got a a very risk averse client the solution that's right for them will be totally different from a client who's saying well look i know i've got to do this but can we do the light version because i don't really want us this to cost me anything and so trying to tread that line because the law is often very gray i mean that's what keeps lawyers in business isn't it Um, and there's a lot of ways that you can legally do something and there are things which are super compliant super compliant and just about compliant and it's understanding where on that pathway a client wants to be to balance that risk compliance Uh, you know, monetary outcome decisions which are running within their own business. We have to understand those before we can design the solution that's right for them. I think having having the different department heads in there as well. So normally one area will bring us in, be it procurement or HR, and and normally and say that we want to talk to you about these subjects or we want your solution for us. What we like to do is, okay, let's get the finance director in. Let's get some hiring managers in as well. So let's get operations in. So we've got HR, finance, procurement and operations because every single one of them will have a different kind of need from the solution we're going to bring to them. HR are going to want that policy and procedure and potentially some stuff off their desk because they're busy doing everything else. Managers, how am I going to get the people? And I want to get them, I want to get them quick. Finance, normally they're like, okay, Cost isn't massive on finances side as long as procurement have done their job. It's more about the process. How can you make sure that I'm getting accurate billing or how can you make sure that uh, the people walking through the door are right? And then procurement is, although they normally say to us, well, we're not just cost driven, they are because that's kind of their core. Um, and it's, if we bring them together from a key stakeholder, we get a really nice balance along the, for the organization because you've got the HR side, you've got, you've got the culture, you've got the ethos, you've got the process, you've got the procedure, you've got the finance. And then the only other person then to add into that, which is where organizations do go wrong, is the person at the top. Because what they normally do is those kind of heads of those departments will start the conversation and then they'll go to the CEO or COO or whatever. And then you have to start it again because you have to educate them through it again. And then you're bringing them on the journey. So we say, look, let's get the top person in now explain it to them so they get it so when we come back and recommend this is a solution we don't have to go through this again in these times so i think that's that's how we kind of get them through the journey or get them to the stage where they go okay we get it this is what you want to do i mean ultimately if you've got a mixture of stakeholders like that then it's a team and you've got a business that are thinking like a business because they're covering all the different um angles 
Um, it's interesting when you talk about the kind of the involvement of procurement and HR, and we can we can come on to this in more detail. I, I think with from from my point of view, when you look at things like services procurement and mm -hmm. the juxtaposition of services procurement or you know the management of statement of work engagements, if you want to look at it that way, compared to traditional contingent workforce, it seems to be very um, there seems to be a real mix in the market as to whether that's something that you know, sits alongside what the uh, HR or contingent workforce function are doing, or whether it's something that's extremely separate, where procurement, uh, this is services procurement, this is, we don't want it to have anything to do with contingent workforce. Do, do you guys see that kind of reflected in different scenarios within the different clients you deal with in terms of which stakeholders feel like there's the, the ownership should be there or control? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, it, yeah it's, it, it's really interesting because we... Um, when we get to those kind of conversations you can normally pick out the person who thinks it's <laughs> service procurement is sitting there going oh well, this this doesn't sit along this but then again when and this is why we take dawn to these meetings when we explain kind of the value that you can bring to them and how we do it you know I, i'm going to literally lift from dawn now because this is something she said so i have to credit <laughs> her for it um the uh yeah. <laughs> It isn't, SOW is not a new thing, certainly not a new thing to us, but it seems to have just gathered absolute pace within, especially in our field and recruitment, that this is the new thing to do. And we're like, well, we've been doing this for 16 years. This isn't new. You know? <laughs> and we've been doing the full, full life cycle of it. So having that conversation with them and just telling them how it works from our perspective, again it's that education piece isn't it Dawn it's getting them on that side and taking them through it so they understand that it's not separate it doesn't need to be separate from yes. the contingent uh, hourly workers workers. yeah I mean I tend to think of it as just looking at how work gets done it's, it's, it's a work delivery mm. method you know in my in my head it's a way of getting something done as are other methods whether it's a permanent employee a temp a contractor etc um what, what do you guys see as the kind of main areas of confusion that exist in the market around SOW and the use of SOW? Wow, that's huge. Um, so I think the first one is that almost nobody understands the distinction. That they don't always even understand the basic distinction that you can either hire Dawn Fold on a time materials basis at however much per hour or per day, or you can uh, buy legal services. You, you want 100 contracts reviewed through to conclusion. You want three pieces of litigation defended for you, whatever the services you're buying. Even on that basic level, the difference between buying the services of a person and buying services, I think, is really not understood at all. And I'm sure we've all got kind of, you know, war stories of uh, when you first started talking with a client. You know, I'll, I'll use myself as an example in this rather than naming the contract you used. Uh, but it was, you know, the uh, consultancy contract for the services of Dawn Ford. And we were talking to the client about statement of work models. And so the next template they put forward was the same document, which just said consultancy services and for the services of Dawn Ford have been deleted and everything else in the contract was exactly the same. And I think that just really sums up um, that there's huge naivety between them. And I completely agree with you, Johnny, it is just about getting the work done. And whether you outsource that under a statement of work, whether that's handled by your permanent headcount, whether you supplement your permanent headcount with contractors to do that, it's just about getting the work done. You're absolutely right. But persuading the client of the differences between those things. And often it's that upfront thought. So if you want a contractor, you phone your agency, you phone your MSP, whatever services you use, you give them a very quick brief from their perspective, probably too short a brief most of the time. And you can have someone start on Monday. Um, whereas if you're outsourcing a piece of work or is it statement of work business, you as the client, you as the hiring manager have to give a lot more thought up front to actually what is the service I need? Because you can't just wait until the contractor starts on Monday and say, OK, right, this week I need you to do this. You have to think about the whole life cycle of the project. And if I'm buying three months or six months of services, I need to understand now what those three months or six months of services look like. And I think that's been one of the major barriers that we found sort of in the last sort of 15, 20 years is you get to that. That's quite a lot of work. But I could just hire Dawn and she can start on Monday. And so there is, I think, kind of an emotional barrier to overcome. Um, but I think in the circumstances we find ourselves at the moment, we've got that sort of somewhat pincer movement situation. So with COVID, we've had lots of people working from home. 
clients have had to get used to the fact that their contractors aren't sitting next to them in the same office as them. And suddenly they're starting to realise that actually it's fine to have gig workers and it's fine not to be working in, in sort of day to day in the same room with a contractor. And so that's starting the conversation of, oh, actually statement of work, maybe that does make more sense. And then we look at IR35, which obviously is having a big tax implication for contractors. A lot of clients are saying, well, if it's statement of work business, it's completely outside of scope of IR35. So suddenly I'm really interested. I really want to talk about this now. And then obviously we come to Brexit. One of the key issues um, for, for us under that is obviously movement of workers. There's going to be significantly less free movement of workers from the beginning of next year than there have been for the last 50 years. So if you can't move your people to where you want them, you have to take the work to where the people are. And, and so that also leads to the, well, we can do this job, but we're going to do it in Germany or we're going to do it in the Netherlands. And so I think all of those things are coming together and we're certainly seeing a sudden rush of discussion about statement of work, consultancy, outsource services. Um, and it's really interesting that it's changed the dynamic of the conversation because for all of the time Neil and I have worked together, we've been sort of, you know, knocking on the client's door saying, we really think you should consider this. We're not saying it's a silver bullet. We're not saying it's ever going to replace all of your contract recruitment. It never will. But you just need to consider this as part of, as you say, Johnny, how do you get the work done? Um, and, and we're really starting to find that that conversation is moving forward much more quickly now as a consequence of legal and political ramifications that are, that are ongoing at the moment. I think the, um, the the biggest thing for me is when we, when we're sitting opposite a client and they say the immortal words, "What do you mean I can't interview a statement of work person?" And then you kind of you kind of judge. Then you go, "Okay, well, I know where your understanding is now, which is fine." So I have to, and this isn't my way of thinking. This was someone else told me this. But I have to take it back to, "Okay, you need to dig a hole, right? You can pay someone an hourly rate to dig that hole for you." Or you can say to someone, right, I want you to dig that hole. It's got to be six feet by three feet. And I want it done within a week. And on Wednesday, I'm going to check with you how far it down. Really, you should be at kind of three feet by Wednesday. And I'm going to pay you £5,000 to do it. You can have 17 people dig the hole and do it in a day. Or you can do it yourself. It takes a week. But I'm going to check in and check those milestones. When I've explained it like that, they, it then kind of the penny suddenly starts to drop. I said, that's the difference between statement of work and having someone for an hour. Though. And I said, and what you're trying to do, Mr. or Mrs. Client, is put the same contract in place. The, the, the hole still gets dug with that shadow of a doubt, but it's how they go about it and what they do. And they kind of then go, oh, okay, well, we've got this part of the business that do it like this. Okay, cool. So let's then work on that. So can you do this? Dawn, do you see, I see a bit of apathy set in when people, they start a statement of work, all the best intentions. So they set the milestones, they'll set all the kind of, break points and stuff and then six months into a project they're just like oh yeah just send the money pay them or have you checked it so th there is a continual management i think as well johnny that the clients aren't yet used to doing uh, and looking at those statement of work whereas with a, as dawn says with a continual worker oh you're here on monday crack on <laughs> right you know let's do this yeah it's so interesting because if you look at it like that you could say okay if, if a client is if, if an sow is not managed that effectively there's still there's still markers in the ground there's still milestones that have deliverable dates so you can yeah. still look at it at the end of it and go well that was supposed to be delivered by that point it wasn't it wasn't delivered so the coo or somebody in procurement or you know an operation line manager somewhere can look at it and go that wasn't delivered on time to budget to satisfaction therefore questions can be asked and you can address it if you've got a contractor and they're just sitting there on a weekly basis it might seem that there's more um scrutiny on what's being done but in, in some way in some ways there's less because you know that that person might not be working very hard, they might not be achieving very much. Yeah. I think it's I, I totally agree with what you guys are saying in the sense that it's it's very much horses for courses. Um, and if you look at sixty years ago when it was all about a job for life and it was just permanent employees, there's kind of one way to get work done. But now there are multiple ways to get work done, and companies need to be wise to it, and they need to be flexible, and they need to be pragmatic. And again, it comes down to business decisions. They need to use the method that is commercially most sensible in each scenario, in my opinion, because that's just business thinking. Um, and I think when you, um, when you look at the choices that people make around it and the approach they take to statement work, I like your description. I'll, ultimately, it's I'll pay you X to deliver Y. I like yeah. your digging a hole description. I think it's really good. and It kind of paints a picture. Um, but also, just to go back to what Dawn was saying earlier, I think that people have to make the mental shift about thinking, at the beginning of the process, not the end of the process. 
Because if people think about the end of the process, they're just thinking that a person is going to be, someone somewhere is going to be doing something. Whereas you, if you think about it at the beginning of the process, you can think, okay, I'm either writing a job description, a role description, Java developer, X, Y, Z, or I'm actually defining a piece of work that needs to get done. I'm defining what's going to happen, what the mm. outcome is going to be. And I think that's such a fundamentally different thing. There's some amazing opportunities coming up, some clever tech companies coming out of um, into the market that are helping companies write statement of work more effectively. I mean, let's face it. I mean, I, prior prior to this, I worked in the kind of job board space, ATS, various other talent and recruitment and workforce type technology. And generally, a lot of companies struggle to even write job specs effectively. Oh yeah. Um, you know, people don't want to spend the time. They just they just think I just want to I just want a Java developer. Just get me a Java developer. Um, whereas there's nuance to all that sort of stuff. So taking that on a level further, writing a proper requirement for a work order that then becomes part of a statement of work is another level. However, it's forcing people to think really uh, hard about what they actually need to get done. Mm. Um, and I think there's some real practical benefits in that. But also, if you have a decent supplier population, your suppliers are there to help you shape requirements. And that's not to say that suppliers are there to just go, give me the work, I'll tell you what needs to be done. It's not six months, it's two years. Don't you worry about that, it's three times the price. That's, that's not the case. If you're tendering through an effective um, competitive bidding process, you should have different expert vetted suppliers that are giving you options and, and helping inform your process. So you're saying, here's a base requirement and, and here's five milestones. You might get another supplier that comes back and says, we can do that in three. And actually, you don't need to do this step because it's included over here. And I think that's um, a very interesting factor that people are starting to get wise to. But ultimately, it still comes down to how do you want to get the work done? What do you want to get done? And what's the most effective way to do it? So I think there is a lot of confusion in the market, but um, the education is definitely starting to happen. Yeah, definitely. Just on that point about everyone's got a job spec, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Dawn. Every single client we talk to is going through, a, all right, we're just refining our job specs and job descriptions. and We're going to have it all done and dusted by the end of the year. We're like, no, you won't, because you'll constantly carry on doing it. And another thing popped to mind when you were saying there, Johnny, about um, kind of people changing the way they, they look at things and, and things like that. We, Dawn and I went to a meeting, I was actually was in Luxembourg and it was part of a tender process and the client turned around to me with an absolute try and curveball us and saying, well, we can't get the talent in uh, this specific location. I'm like, okay, well, what competitors are you getting? Ah, uh, yeah, well, the competitors are paying more and they're in a better location. And if anyone leaves us, we don't have them back. And I was like, well, you've just answered the question for me. I said, well, what do you do about it? Well, I said, I'd probably pay the same. I'd probably look at the t And you just, you then, when you go on that kind of conversation with them, you kind of see their lights and their eyes go on and go, oh God, why haven't we thought about this before? But most clients are so ingrained in the day to day, like, and they can't see above the, projects they're on or the the next strategy they're trying to get through or the next and then pull into that covid brexit and you, you're asking them to think about well you've got to manage milestones you've got to put this contract in place but it can't be the same as this human nature is dawn i'm pretty sure you're better challenged in saying this than me is to get around stuff and do stuff quickly you know and we just find that people start with the best intentions they just don't keep on top of it you know, but it, it has so many benefits for them if they do. I mean, this is why we exist, you know, to be honest, because they're like, we want you to be on top of it. We want to come to you and every three months and sell, you tell us how you're doing and do that. And it's just that it takes that, you kind of see their shoulders go down. Like, you're going to do all that, aren't you? And it's like, well, yeah. So, oh, okay, that's good. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> it's madness. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's ultimately it's the use of expertise where it's where yeah. it's most effective. So for, for some organizations, some organizations will say, we're going to do this all ourselves. We've got the resource internally. We're going to pay that resource. They're going to take the time to do it. Or they'll say, we'll outsource it to experts. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at the, the drivers that there are at the moment that are to a large extent, I mean, you know, outcome-based work delivery is massive. What the, the services procurement market is worth somewhere between one and three trillion annually. Um, it's absolutely massive, you know, consultancy, professional services, any type of services delivery is absolutely huge. But I do think the, there is a growth in um, outcome-based work delivery or a, or, a, or a growing recognition of it. Mm. Um, but there are factors that are, when you get something like an IR35, it's an unavoidable thing that people have to comply with. 
And there's obviously um, some of the laws, like for example, the, I can't remember what it's called, um, A1B or H1B, I can't remember what it is, but basically the, the, the California um, law yeah. around kind of co-employment. Um, the, the, it, similar things are gonna happen elsewhere. There's stuff that's going on in places like Belgium and mm -hmm. Germany in relation to employment status. And I think you know other companies will will try and address these issues uh, in a similar manner. So so it's a line in the sand that people have to take action, and suddenly everyone's got to be educated about it, and they'll realise the advantages of just having another string to their bow in in getting work done. I think the Brexit one is probably the factor that I understand the least. Um, very very interesting what you were saying earlier, Dawn. So so from a Brexit point of view. Obviously, there's restrictions on movements. So for an organisation that wants to hire, they, they're going to be restricted from hiring certain people because they're outside the EU, if you're a UK company. How does that work if you're outsourcing services to a supplier in terms of where they're based and how the rules affect them as a kind of second tier? Um, so th there are some advantages. So the, the new immigration rules, which, are, which will come into effect on the 1st of January, effectively expand what the current tier two visa allows for. So the tier two visa is where the employer has a sponsorship license, the employer issues the visa, and that visa is linked to that job. So if that person changes jobs, changes clients, they need a new visa. But that can be really useful for an outsourcing company because, of course, if they are responsible for, for providing services, they can employ people from overseas on that visa because that person is working for them, whereas that person can't be used as a contractor. So it is um, that the immigration changes are much more beneficial for outsourcing than they are for straight recruitment, um, simply because there are more immigration options available for an outsourcing company um, than there are for a recruitment company who is just trying to bring in headcount. So that's a, one obvious advantage is that they will have more access to talent quicker um, than a recruitment company will have. But of course, as well, if you're saying, well, I, my client is in the UK and they need to buy a certain outsourced service, but it doesn't really matter where that's delivered from. Um, then if there is more talent in France at the moment, well, that's fine. It can be delivered from France. Um, I think what's very interesting with Brexit, and we don't fully know the outcome of this yet, is obviously the situation with regards to tariffs. Um, so services are a little bit easier because they uh, services cross borders all the time. Uh, yeah. You know, every, every time I email advice to my colleagues in Belgium, services have crossed borders. Um, so uh, for us, actually, uh, you know, thinking about it from the administrative perspective, services is actually really straightforward. It's when you're outsourcing something which is goods related um, that is going to be incredibly complex moving forward. Because one, there's something like five times as many customs requirements as there would have been this time last year. Uh, and then also we don't know at this stage, and this obviously rests in the deal, no deal situation as to what tariffs, what additional taxation uh, will be applicable. So then you have the balance between, I might have to pay a little bit more to get the talent if I'm just hiring people in the UK, but then if I have it made in France, I've got to pay more tax to get it imported into the UK. Um, and so for clients at the moment, it's a very difficult time because there are so many moving pieces and none of us actually know what the final outcome will be yet. And obviously companies are trying to make decisions three, five years in advance, or at least their growth plans are based on that basis. And actually they can't even make a decision yet as to what will be the cheapest method come January, never mind three years from now. Um, so that is a very challenging time, but at least from an immigration perspective, uh, it's a great time for outsourcing. Although we're losing free movement of workers, so all of those 27 other countries whose nationals used to be able to come and live and work here without any restriction that's ending at 11 p.m on the 31st of december but at least an outsourcing company has a replacement it can say well this person has the skill set that i need i'm prepared to pay the minimum wage for that person i can evidence that there's a skills shortage so i need to bring this person in and yes there's a cost with that so it's a, it's a thousand pounds for the visa there'll almost certainly be some additional costs in terms of contributing to nhs costs and things like that so it's not free um, but it does give an access to talent which isn't available in the contractor space although obviously a client 
can still use the same immigration rules to hire someone permanently. But as we all know, there are all kinds of reasons why clients want to control headcount on their own books. So although I think some clients will have a small amount of increase in their permanent headcount, I think actually this will be the driver for a lot of clients saying, actually, if I've got to get a sponsorship license and then I'm liable for correctly issuing the visa and I'm liable for checking up that that visa is being appropriately used, I don't want that liability. Uh, I could just get an outsourcing company to do that. And thanks very much. I just wash my hands of that problem. Um, so I think it's a real game changer in this industry in terms of suddenly there is a real advantage for outsourcing companies in terms of access to the people they need. Yeah. Oh, it's fascinating. The biggest question we get, Johnny, and, th and, and this is, Again, you've just witnessed firsthand why I take Dawn to these meetings. <laughs> <laughs> so interesting, um, it really is. Yeah, well, yeah, you just yeah. sit there and there's stuff that I don't even think of because I'm, I'm thinking, well, how can we solution this? But the, do you know the first and biggest question we get is, how is Brexit going to affect me? Mm. And Dawn will then take a breath and go, okay, right then. So, uh, and then has to go. Oh, to <laughs> they're, they're, yeah, they're just thinking of the movement of workers. And it's so much deeper and wider than that, that they haven't even thought about their goods. They haven't even thought about stuff coming in and, and that kind of stuff. We did a webinar recently, didn't we, Dawn, about it? And the, the feedback I was getting from people was, oh, my word, I, I had no idea. I had to think about all these other things. I was thinking about how am I going to get these people from this country, whereas I've got all this other stuff to kind of think about and pull in as well. So there's, there is a definite, and it's, you know, as Dawn, you rightly said, we don't know at the moment because of what's going on. I think that's the main thing and that's going to perpetuate an absolute nervousness the closer we get to it. You know, when people just come to us and ask us, guys, help me. And we're like, well, what are you trying to do? Like, well, we don't know. We just think we need help. <laughs> it's just like, so yeah, <laughs> crazy. I, I, it is. And, and <clears throat> from my personal point of view, I don't feel like there's that many people in the market talking about it. Um, and that might be because that's not where, where my interest is or where my, my interest has been. But when you talk about it in the context of getting work done and changing the landscape of how um, work is resourced in the UK, it's potentially massive. Um, I mean, if you look at that, plus R35, both happening in the same year with COVID in the background, that's yeah. such a massive flux in the UK in particular. Yeah. Obviously, COVID is affecting the, the whole world, but... Um, just in terms of the pressure on UK businesses to adapt, what a, it's, it's kind of... It's, it's yeah. a once in a generation change. It feels like it, it certainly yeah, does. It absolutely is. And, 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 the, sorry, carry on. No, no, don't, what, what we've also noticed, Johnny, as well, just to add into this, is I, literally me and my team have spoke about it this week. I've spoken to other tech providers as well to see if they're feeling the same. The kind of passion and drive from people has drained away because it's second lockdown in the UK you know it feels to me like we're a week before Christmas because everyone's <laughs> like I just need to get through 2020 I just need to get through and if I can get to Christmas it, it that that emotional kind of way people are feeling they're tired you know I mean, working from home is fantastic I love it I'm in Birmingham I don't need to travel to London every other day this is great but at times I'm sitting there going oh this has been long this has been hard so if you add that into the mix as well people's appetite for change and tackling this huge kind of thing is at the moment is really low from what we're seeing you know it's um so i think that's a really big thing as well to be honest i don't know if you've seen that as well or dawn but we're, we're seeing that right now in, in our team and with clients as well they're very uh, much going to wait till jan 21 i can i can see how from an emotional aspect you know i, I totally get that but mm -hmm. i think from the point of view of businesses making decisions around what they need to do, they know that Brexit is happening. Oh, they've got to do it. In yeah. theory, you know, there's obviously still some questions around exactly how, but they know that R35 is happening. So I think that is, um, that tends to, at the executive level, that mm. will banish the apathy. On, but on a day-to-day -day level, generally for people, globally, yeah, I totally agree. It's just, you know, never in my lifetime has there been so much uncertainty, um, mm. just in general. You know, will there be Christmas? Um, <laughs> you know, what, what, what's going to happen? Is Christmas cancelled? Uh, you know, and, and what's next year going to look like? Are we going to be pushed into a lockdown for six months because we're waiting for the vaccine to be uh, trialled? You know, we were talking about, um, you know, this, the fact this vaccine is a, a 
based on using RNA to replicate certain parts of the coronavirus within a host cell and then build immunity based on that. You know, it's all new stuff. So the level of uncertainty is just um, incredible. But the areas of certainty within that are that there are changes happening that people need to adapt to. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's an opportunity for companies to look at the way they do things and to make sure they're doing things properly. I mean, even in some ways, R35, the reforms to R35, in some ways, all they are is just forcing people to do what R um, HMRC wanted them to do in the first place. Yeah. Um, so, so I think in terms of yeah, being able to take pragmatic action, it's, it must be horrendous for a lot of companies to, to manage all of these things, but hopefully there will be some longer term positives out of them in terms of productivity. And ultimately, if you're a business, you, you're, only, you're only as successful as the way you operate in the conditions that you're operating under. And the conditions have changed drastically and are changing with these, with these factors. So companies have got to adapt if they want to thrive um, you know, as we move into the future. Um, it's certainly going to be an interesting year next year, isn't it? <laughs> Let's face it. It definitely will. It definitely will. But, I, you know, optimistically, we should have a number of vaccines being rolled out. Obviously, Pfizer have been the first to declare, but I don't think the AstraZeneca one will be far behind. Um, and that's a fantastic thing for a number of reasons, because they're different types of vaccine. Uh, and so they will give different types of immunity, which is brilliant because the best way of, of cracking a virus which mutates all the time is to have lots of different ways of fighting it so i personally i'm very optimistic that 2021 will be a lot easier i think it will still be different i still don't think we'll call it normal in terms of what we understood normal to be previously um, but i think we're definitely moving in the direction of the, the right road to come out the other side of this which is frankly overdue because you know as you say neil it's um i think a lot of companies had the initial panic stations in the first lockdown, you know, they had to learn what furlough was, you know, unless they were an American company or had worked with a lot of American clients, never heard of furlough before, didn't know what it was. Lots of companies kind of facing a, a cliff edge of losing all of their business or losing vast amounts of their business really quickly. And actually, you know, as much as this, it's been a really difficult year, lots of companies have found ways of working from home. And so we do have, it doesn't feel very normal, but it is a kind of normal existing at the moment. And so that initial panic station has passed. Some companies, of course, haven't survived it very sadly, but those who are going now are kind of are in a bit of a lull of, okay, what do we do next? How do we trade our way out of COVID? What does Brexit mean? How do I get uh, you know, ready for IR35. As you say, Neil, they're a bit tired, but it's quite a cerebral moment. Everyone's kind of giving it a lot of thought. Yeah. And I think we'll probably see in January, everybody will come back and go, oh, oh, oh Brexit's happened. Uh, what do I do now? Oh, IR35, it's only three months away. You know, and there'll be an awful lot of headless chickens in the first part of next year. Um, yeah. I think that's really fair because actually, until we get a deal, you know, things as, as significant as we don't actually know what data protection plans we need to have in place at this right. point in time. And the end is really close. So all of the things which uh, people like me spend a lot of time updating in contracts, we're, we're, we're not sitting around twiddling our fingers, but there's literally nothing we can do to amend those at the moment. So there's a, a whole lot of well, if this happens, then that. But if that happens, then this. Um, and so there's a lot of, we might potentially do one of these 10 things, depending on what happens next. Um, so I think that there is a little bit of a pause at the moment where people are considering, trying to consider what all the possible outcomes will be. And then once we either get a decision on, on the Brexit trade deal, uh, whichever way it goes, I think then we will start to see an awful lot of changes happening all at once because mm -hmm. then people will know what's happening with Brexit. They can formulate their plans uh, for that. There's obviously optimism. I, I have optimism, at least, that we're looking to a more positive uh, year next year with COVID. And then suddenly as we get to January, you know, IR35 is a bare three months away. And if contractors are on one month's notice, then that's effectively two months away for the purposes of, of getting your contracts updated, your processes updated, training your hiring managers and using whatever tools you're going to use. Um, so I think January is going to be crackingly busy. Yeah. And coming back to your point, Johnny, about, you know, you don't see many people going out there and, and talking about Brexit and giving that information. I think one of the things is they're probably scared to say we don't know. Whereas yeah. every single conversation we have with clients or webinars or whoever we're talking to, and Dawn is always the one with, with us leading this and going through, and he's like, guys, this is going to change. You know, and, and if you've got a question, we may not have the answer, but 
when we go through that with them and say, well, as Dawn just said there, well, this could happen or that could happen and this could happen, that generates more questions. But just going up to them and saying, look, we don't know yet. And this is why we don't know as an organization because of X, Y, Z. You do see the relief on their face because they, they don't know either. You know, and they're going, well, what do I do? And they're looking for someone to give them the answer. But when they've got that, that person sitting up with them going, don't worry if you don't know yet because they've not told us yet. Yeah, so it's okay. I mean, <laughs> so, exactly. I think that's a huge factor in the sense that people want someone to tell them, but mm. if, if someone can't tell them, they, they want to know that smart people are on it. You know, yeah. smart people are on the case with it. I, I, you know, in terms of the, the likely outcomes, Dawn, what's your, what's your kind of gut feeling on when and how the kind of the, the, the path forward with Brexit is likely to land? Okay, I'll pull out my crystal ball because I think that's probably the most useful device we have in, in determining this at the moment. So we've already passed what was originally the final date for a Brexit deal. That passed back in the middle of October. So we're in uncharted territory. That was originally the last date the EU said a deal could be made on. But guess what? We're still around the table. We're still talking to some extent. So clearly it's still possible for a deal to be done. There is uh, another meeting with all the EU members on the 16th of December. So I think realistically speaking, we now have to consider the 16th of December as the drop dead date for the last day on which we'll know whether there will or won't be a deal. Um, but we, we have got used to the noise of EU deadlines whooshing past us over the last four years. So I, I may well yet be proved wrong on that. So my, my, my best guess is the 16th of December is, is kind of the final date on which the, the deal, no deal can come to fruition. How likely is one or the other? Uh, I think the tables have turned a little bit in the last couple of weeks with the US elections. Uh, you know, Trump was a very bombastic, is a very bombastic character. Um, a lot was- He being, hasn't gone uh, yet, Dawn, he hasn't gone yet. <laughs> and I think the actual manner of his going might be quite interesting yet. Um, but he obviously had sort of, you know, talked the talk with regard to a, a US-UK trade deal. And if, if we stand in his shoes for a moment, um, his drivers were not ours in the sense that he was very motivated by the pharmaceutical lobby, who was lobbying for access to drug markets in the UK access to the NHS um, so obviously what the UK wanted and what the US wanted were very different but there was at least a motivation on both sides to move forward uh, with a trade deal. Um, Biden has a much broader worldview, uh, is very pro the EU, is uh, a big defender of the rights in Ireland so not wanting to uh, get to a position where there is a boundary between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So there's a lot of reasons why it would be fair to consider he's much more pro-EU uh, than Trump. And also he he spoke out against the possibility of Brexit before the Brexit vote happened. You yeah. know, he's on record as having said he thought the UK was stronger in the EU and he thought the EU was stronger with the UK. Um, so I think he will be much more EU friendly than Trump has been. And so I think the only deal that is possibly on the table now is with the EU. Whereas a few weeks ago before the US election, there was the possibility of a US-UK trade deal in the near-ish future, at least enough that for political reasons, Boris Johnson could have said, oh, well, we're going to walk away from this EU trade deal because we've got this amazing deal with the US coming. And I just think that's become infinitely less believable at the moment. So I think Biden's election has resulted in an EU deal being more likely the terms of that, though, remain a complete mystery at the moment. I mean, the discussion in the press is all about fishing rights uh, and all about state sponsorship of companies that are in financial trouble. I really can't believe that either side would walk away from the deal over one of those two things. Uh, you know, fishing represents 0.5% of GDP in the UK. I'm not saying fishermen aren't important, but they're 0.5% important in financial terms, as compared with 80% of the UK's trade is with the EU. Now, really, are either side going to say, yes, the most important thing is the fishing rights versus the 80% trade? 
it's not very believable to me. So my personal view is actually it's all in the detail of what the tariffs will be moving forward, what the restrictions are on the UK. Uh, obviously, Boris Johnson has spoken a lot about the Canadian agreement that the EU has, but that's obviously based on a country which is 4,000 miles away. Uh, whereas, you know, we can, on a clear day, literally wave at France across the channel. Um, and so we are their next door neighbour. We will always be in competition with them. And so the things which the EU are prepared to compromise on with the UK will be very different from the things they were prepared to compromise on with Canada. Um, and I think the UK know that it's just they don't want to admit that in public because that would you know uh, damage their hand in terms of the negotiation so i think frankly none of us know the details none of us are close enough and if i was a negotiator i wouldn't declare that either at the moment so i don't take any adverse inference from that i think that's just the nature of the beast it, it ought to be a confidential negotiation one or other side would lose strength in the negotiation if they showed too much publicly but i do think we now have a greater chance of a deal than we had a couple of weeks ago even allowing for the fact the timeline is now very short Interesting. I think we're looking at some uh, some pivotal moments in history that will be the sort of thing that kids are learning about in years to come, whether it's the use of statistics, uh, the way pandemics uh, operate, um, you know, immunity, or even just things like negotiation, like the negotiation tactics, when they, when they wash all this up, you know, years down the line. If you think about the negotiating positions of the EU versus the UK in terms of the balance of power and, and what levers there are to pull is fascinating. Um, can, you imagine, yeah, can you imagine being a history graduate or major looking at 25 years time, looking back at this and going, they did what? <laughs> he got the scepter from and he walked out. What? What does that mean? I mean, it's going to be that that crazy because if you, do, I look back over the timeline and stuff and because when it happens real time, you kind of forget what we've gone through. But when you look back at the timeline, you just think, oh, my word, we did that. We did that. You know, and then they said this and then this happened. And then Dawn has this fantastic saying, which I completely plagiarise with so many people, but I do credit her when I say it, is that she used to say a week is a long time in politics and she changed it to an hour is a long time in politics now. So it's just it's that it's that changeable. Well, people will be looking back and going, oh, my God, there was COVID and Brexit yeah. and Scotland won the Euros. It's like, you know. <laughs> Look, let's, right, let's not get ahead of ourselves. I am so very excited. I mean, it, it's, it comes to a state when, you know, I'm happy we've qualified, right? It could end now, and I'm happy. I mean, me and my dad, are, you know, we're going to get tickets, but I was, he, he said, oh, yeah, but we've got England at, at, at Wembley. And I said, oh, dad, I'm not going to Wembley. I'm not seeing Scotland lose at Wembley. And he went, and he said to me, he goes, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, Neil. I watched him lose to England at Hamden. Hamden, it still hurts. <laughs> so, so I, <laughs> So, yeah. Uh, well, I think either way, you know, hopefully there's lots of, lots of, um, well, there's certainly going to be lots of change in 2021. Um, but hopefully there's some really positive things to look forward to as well. Um, yeah, and it's going to be very interesting to see how it all plays out. Um, but listen, thank you both so much. I really, really appreciate your time. Um, fascinating topics. And it's, uh, you know, you've both spoken brilliantly. Um, and it's great to hear your expertise and your your kind of insights. It's super, super interesting. So really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, good luck with everything. It'll be uh, great to see how it all plays out. Yeah. So let's see where we are in a year's time when we have another webinar. So remember that webinar we did? Yeah, yeah. this is what actually happened. <laughs> so, yeah. Excellent. Superb. All right. Well, listen, thank you both very much. And um, yeah, on that note, uh, let's end and uh, hopefully catch up with you guys soon. Great. Thanks, Johnny. Great to speak.